All right. So um, today we are continuing in our study of the book of Acts. And um, what, what we've had, what we have had uh, the privilege and honor of doing is diving into to the scriptures. Let's see. Can you see my screen there? Let's see. All right. You should be able to see my screen. Okay, good. Um, so we've we've dove into the book of Acts and we've been able to uh to look at the book of Acts um by each theme that that it presents us. We started out in Acts 9 uh with the conversion of the apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul. And we're able to walk through the early steps of his life. And then a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Acts chapters one and two. And, uh, and we learned how the church was founded and built on power. Today, um, and that's the, the resurrection power. That's a great, great Bible study. Check that out if you're listening or you're watching this video and you've missed that one. You're going to want to be a part of that. And then today we're diving into Acts chapter number three, and uh, we're going to look at the very first miracle to take place in the early church. Now, this miracle is very, very significant based on how it took place. And so let's go ahead and take a look in our Bibles at the book of Acts, chapter number three, we're going to start reading at verse number one, and I'm reading in the New Living Translation, and this is where it gets exciting. So let's begin. It says, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money, but Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then, walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. And all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade, where the lame or where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Wow. So this portion of scripture begins with an exciting story of, of, of God's power. Um, Acts chapter number three is very, very important because one of the things that we have to do when we're reading the Bible, there are so many things to consider as far as context goes. And so for us to understand just how significant Acts chapter number three is, it's important for us to know where and when these events took place. So where did Acts chapter number three came? take place? Well, it tells us in these verses that it took place at the temple in Jerusalem, at the temple in Jerusalem. 
So what is why why is Jerusalem significant? Because Jesus was um basically functioning in the town of Jerusalem. Um, and that's where he was he was accused, he was tried, he was arrest, arrested, he was um tried, he was beaten, he was killed, he was hung on a cross, he was killed, he was buried, and he rose again. And he hung around in Jerusalem for 40 days or so, ministering to people, explaining to them the resurrection. And then he was able to give them instructions like we read in Luke 24, we read in Mark 16, we read in Acts chapter number one. He gave them instructions to wait in Jerusalem until they received the promise of the Father, until they received the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter number two, while these um, hundred and something people were praying, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Bible says they were speaking in tongues, speaking in a language that they didn't learn. All of this took place in Jerusalem. And immediately, Peter seized the opportunity on the day of Pentecost, on this Jewish feast holiday, uh, where Jews were gathered from all around the known world, Peter seized this opportunity to preach to them a message that would set a precedent for the church going forward. He told them that the Jesus that the Old Testament spoke about, the prophets had spoken about, that Jesus, you crucified him. The Messiah that you were waiting for, you crucified him. And so based on his sermon, based on the message that he preached, they were convicted. And so they asked the question, well, what do we do? He told them to repent, be baptized for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You'll receive the Holy Spirit exactly the way you see it taking place right now in this moment. So we, we read about over 3,000 people coming into the church. Now we get to Acts chapter number three. So this is still taking place in Jerusalem. Immediately after the church is born, we see that the, the, that the disciples, um, the apostles were instantly engaging in regular structured um, practices as a part of the early church. It says that they went to the temple at three o'clock for prayer. Why, why do we discuss this? Because that was a regular habit that early Christians had, is that they gathered in the church for prayer. And it's important for us to know that because, unfortunately, one of the more neglected things uh, that we see in the modern church is prayer meetings and prayer time. One of the most um, neglected uh, gatherings at our churches are not Sunday mornings. They're not our Bible studies that we hold during midweek, but they're opportunities to gather and pray. But conversely, we see we, we, we see, not conversely, but adversely, we see the, the early apostles gathering for prayer regularly. We can't miss an opportunity for prayer. Prayer is absolutely essential. And one of the things that we want to make sure that we capture from this and, and, and throughout the book of Acts and throughout the Bible is this small little theme. It's a missable detail if you're not careful. And that detail is this, that in the Bible, most miracles take place around a few different events. Most miracles that we read about in the Bible take place around a few different events. Number one is preaching. You're, we're going to be reading throughout the book of Acts, and you're going to see miracles take place centered around a time where the preaching of the word was taking place. Secondly, 
It's the assembling of believers. And so when the miracles begin to take place, it's usually happening when believers have come together. And then thirdly, it's prayer. So preaching, assembling together, and prayer. Usually between a combination of those things or one or one to three of those, one or two or three of those things, when any of those events are taking place, miracles happen, which is why for Remnant Park Church, when we finally establish a set time for prayer, it would it is absolutely advantageous for you to be a part. If you're able to, to be a part of the preaching, you should. If you're able to be a part of the assembling of believers, you should. And when it comes time for us to pray, you should definitely be a part of that. And again, we'll, we'll highlight different events that are different miracles that take place for these particular events. But I don't want to get too far off on that. I do want to make mention, though, that the apostles had a discipline and that they would gather for prayer. And so what happened was there was a man. Well, well, let me say this. This took place in Jerusalem. Um, I want to mention when it happened. On the timeline of the church, when did this take place? It took place, historians believe, in, in um, 29 AD. Why is 29 AD significant? Well, we've already touched on it. This is the same year that Jesus was crucified and had resurrected. It's the same year that the um, Acts chapters 1 and 2 take place, and the Holy Spirit was poured out. So within a year's time, all of these things have transpired. It's the same year that over 3,000 people were baptized and added to the church. So it's important for us to know that there's not years that are going by here. All of this is happening within, and we don't know specifics, but it's within, I would say, a matter of weeks. And so... Um, it, it speaks to the fact that if, if, you're, if you're living for God, we cannot expect ourselves to begin to see things transpiring in our lives and in our churches. We can't expect years to go by for these things to take place. These things can happen as soon as the power of God is activated because miracles and 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 of uh, and people being added to the church, people getting saved, people converting and changing their lives over, all of these things take place as a result of the power of God being present. It really doesn't matter the the individual that is, let's say, leading all of this, because if you remember just about 50 to 50 to 60 days prior to this. Peter had denied Jesus. That's right. Peter had denied Jesus. In fact, all of the apostles scattered and all of the apostles left during the, during the trial and crucifixion and the death of Jesus Christ. They all scattered. And now we see some two months later that the church is being built and that they are leading it. And God is using them in, in, in performing miracles. So don't allow your past failures to dictate whether or not God can use you. If you repent of your sins and if you commit your life wholly to God and if you allow the spirit of God to work through you, then God can use you immediately. That's the beautiful thing about the grace of God. So we see that within the same few months time, all of this stuff is happening, and it's happening fast. And so let's get to the miracle. So they're going to church, they're going to pray, and there's a man who's been lame or crippled since birth. And it's probably safe to assume he's an adult man because um, he had been carried to this location every day. Every day he has friends that are committed to helping him and they carry him to the to the church and they lay him at the gate 
and he begs for money. And the, 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 the amazing thing <laughs> is that when the, when the apostles came, they, they weren't wealthy people. They weren't wealthy people. And so when he began to ask them for money, like he would ask anyone else, they could not offer him money. But what they offered him was an amazing launch for the early church. And that they, they, we, we hear the scripture all the time where, um, and, and I've quoted it in the, in the King James version where it says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I do have, I give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So a miracle is performed here. With boldness, the apostles were able to, to not worry about what others think, thought at the moment. They weren't ashamed of Jesus any longer, but they were allowing the power of God to move through them. And this same power that operated through the apostles can operate through any spirit-filled believer. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a pastor to allow the spirit of God to flow through you. All you need to do is have faith in God that he can do it. And God simply looks for people who will, will trust him and, and will allow him. To, to use them in this way. And so this is exactly what the apostles did. They reached out their hand, they lifted him up. And the Bible tells us that he began to gain strength in his legs. And the interesting thing is, the Bible tells us how he responded. And so this is the first time where we actually see and read about a demonstrative response to the power of God through a miracle. Now, we read a little bit about it in Acts chapter 2. It says when the Spirit of God came upon them, it says that um, they, they, you know, there was tongues like as a fire that sat on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and the onlookers thought that they were drunk. So there must have been some type of behavior to cause people to think that they were drunk. I, I'm willing to, 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 uh, to agree that it is demonstrative worship. And so here we see the lame man, just like in the book of Acts, begin to respond demonstratively through the working of a miracle on in his body. It says that he jumped up, stood to his feet, uh, and began to walk and says, then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple. He went into the temple and he went with the apostles. And it says, all of the people heard him praising God in church. <laughs> they heard him praising God in church. And they realized, hey, this was the guy that was was a lame man. So several things here. First and foremost, God used imperfect people to work a miracle through. That's grace. That is God not holding our past against us. But when we finally get our minds focused on him, he'll use us to do the miraculous. Secondly, God's grace was at work in this lame man's life. So for years, most of his, most, all of his life, he had been crippled since birth. And finally, his time came. He would be faithful to coming to the temple. Something in him knew that he was going to receive charity from people who frequently attended services at the temple, except the charity he would receive this time would be a miracle. And his response to that miracle was leaping and praising God to the point where everyone heard it. So we see, a, we see a number of things taking place. We see the grace of God at work. 
We see people who aren't ashamed to be used in the miraculous, people who aren't ashamed to be to worship God demonstratively. These are several takeaways that we see as a as a, a lesson, not just for us, but we see this as a precedent for the early church going forward. And so we'll see where people respond with joy and excitement whenever they receive something for God. Think about this. It, it works in our natural life. Whenever you receive something that's special, whenever you receive the gift, whenever you're surprised with something that is of value to you, you typically respond with an outburst of an emotion. Some people cry and weep. Some people clap and get excited. This type of worship is, is, the, is the new precedent that we see setting up in the book of Acts. When God does something for you, it is, it is okay to respond. We do that naturally when we receive a gift. We do that, you know, through our regular our regular lives. If you come into a raise or if you get money, these things are a natural response. And so what we are tempted to do is suppress our excitement. We're tempted to suppress our worship when we come into church circles. And, and that could be for a number of reasons. But the Bible gives us a a liberty, if I can use that word. It gives you a license to praise the Lord. And so this is what has taken place. And this is a beautiful setup going forward for God's people. So this is great news for us. Um, so as we continue throughout the book of, of, of um, Acts chapter number three, what we begin to now see is um, a, a, a move of God take place. We see a, the, the, the person who receives it respond demonstratively, getting the attention of everyone that is around, causing them to ask questions. What is going on here? Does that sound familiar? It should, because that is exactly what took place in the book of Acts. We see um, we see a, 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 a demonstration of God's power, we see people responding, and we see onlookers questioning. And then Peter preaches, and many get saved. The same thing happens in the book of Acts chapter number three. We see the power of God come over this lame man, we see him respond demonstratively with excitement, with dancing and praising. And then we read about the onlookers. We see how they're confused. They're like, wasn't this the lame man? How is this taking place? And just like in the book of Acts, we now read where Peter preaches. And so in verse number 12 of verse of chapter three, it says, Peter saw his opportunity and, in, and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said, why, or excuse me, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant, Jesus, by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. And he goes on to preach that that Jesus that did this miracle is the same Jesus that you crucified. He preaches the exact same message that he preached in the book of Acts. It's amazing. You see, we don't have to change our message to fit the scenario. We don't have to change our message to reach certain groups. We don't have to change our message to, with the times to make it more contemporary. The same message that worked in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter number three still works and it still produces results. 
God usually responds with a demonstration of power. People look on that power with confusion. And then you're able to preach to them that the power that they're witnessing is available to everyone who wants it. It's available to everyone who desires it. And so after, after Peter finished preaching to them the, the, the power of Jesus Christ and that the, the Jesus that, that was indeed the Messiah that the prophet spoke of, we, we look here in, uh, in verse number 19, and, it, and Peter tells them this. He says, now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then the time of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. This is important because this is the death, burial, and resurrection. He told them to repent. He said, and from that, through that process, you'll have your sins washed away or blotted out. And then he says, the time of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. Or in other words, the spirit of God will be poured out and you'll receive his spirit. So the book of Acts chapter number three is an amazing testament to what we can expect to see in our church services. The entire point of us going through the book of Acts is for us to see what took place then so that we make sure we're not missing out on those key details so that when we gather for our worship, when we gather in our churches, in our churches, we need to make sure that we are reflecting the things that took place in the book of Acts. And so Acts chapter number three, just as a recap, just to summarize. We see the power, well, we see the apostles going to church for prayer. We see them gathering for prayer, just like in the book of Acts, chapter number two, when, when Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem and pray until you receive power, they're going to, ch to church to pray. And then the power of God is, is demonstrated on a lame man, and a miracle takes place. And he begins to worship and, and, and demonstratively praise God publicly, without embarrassment, without being ashamed. We see onlookers questioning what is taking place. We thought he was, we, we thought he was, he was lame. How could he be doing this? Just like in the book of Acts. How can they be speaking our language? How is this possible? They're wrestling with the practical um, possibility of something supernatural. This gives the apostle the opportunity to preach to them Jesus Christ, explaining to them that the power that is demonstrated comes from the one whom you crucified, the one whom the, the prophets, the one who, they, who the scriptures spoke of. And once they've gotten a hold of the, the, the understanding of, their, of, of what they have done wrong, then he gives them the salvation message. Repent, be baptized and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that concludes the book of Acts chapter number three. I encourage you to read it in its entirety. Um, hopefully the few details that we were able to share with you today will be beneficial to you as you're reading. And at, in going forward, let's continue to read our Bibles. Um, we, we have our daily Bible devotional that we read. If you're interested in receiving a link to that so that you can join us in reading the Bible each day, reach out to us through a direct message. Um, we'd love to share uh, the information with you so that you can be a part. Also, um, looking forward to uh, being in service this weekend at Remnant Park Church this Sunday at 10 a.m., uh, in the NRG Med Center area of Houston, Texas. If you would like to join us for that, we would love to have you. We're going to be celebrating one year of being a church. We have been a church for exactly one year, and so we'll be celebrating that this weekend. So that's all that I have. I'm going to end the recording, and for those that are on the call, this will be a time where we can all just have discussion. In the meantime, we look forward to seeing you on the next Bible study, and um, it should be a good time. God bless you all.
Hey, Pastor. <laughs>